Table Talk Radio episode, no, season two. That's what we're doing. <laughs> A radio show that confesses Christ. Without confusing the law and the gospel. A radio show that takes scripture seriously. Without taking ourselves so seriously. You're listening to Table Talk Radio. I, I like how he ran in the room thinking that you accidentally articulated baptism incorrectly. Like, <laughs> wait a minute, you're he mistaken. Said to me, he said, you sound like a heretic. Right, yeah. It wasn't like, boy, they must be playing a game where they're articulating someone else's belief. It was, I think Pastor Wolfmiller is off his rocker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit disturbed that you think that I would actually teach that about baptism. Pastor and it's so, 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 so deserved to be crunched. I mean, mega crunch. <laughs> so, uh, if you guys put the mega, mega crunch. crunch on the song, that would be awesome. <laughs> Keep uh, preaching the word. Pastors. Keep it mediocre. Mediocre and hilarious. Table Talk Radio Season 2, back in style. How's well, Season 2? Because we, we couldn't remember what episode we were on, so we're like, let's just start a new season. <laughs> Season one lasted 10 years. Probably ne <laughs> next episode will be season three because we're, we're going to lose track again. We got the so, visual gags now, too. We got to figure that out. Look how my yeah, Luther bobblehead looks like he's uh, he, it's kind of the spring is kind of broken. So it looks, just looks like he's indifferent, you know. <laughs> so, okay, so for those listening, uh, what's what's the new feature of, of season two? We're trying to do this because I, I, I like the YouTubes, remember? And so we're saying, hey, what if we uh, what if we do a video slash audio podcast and see how that works and see what that looks like? So so you can watch this on YouTube on the YouTubes or you can listen on the podcast while they let us go on. Now, am I am I understanding right that uh, this was by popular demand because everyone was saying, look, we, we see you all the time, but where where's Evan on the YouTube? That's and so. Right. I mean, just by sheer demand of all of our listeners, balance out the beauty. <laughs> like we know you're the brains of the operation but we want to see the beauty of you. that's right <laughs> and your luxurious radio studio there in the back oh yeah coming to you from the studios of krrc in uh rogue river. this 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 is actually the back room of club rogue river you don't realize that but. <laughs> that's the dj box <laughs> I, you can also see in my background all the books I ordered by the foot for my Zoom background to create the illusion <laughs> of intelligence. That's a thing. Did you know? So this is a you can I saw on the Wall Street Journal or something that you can go this this warehouse of book of a bookseller and you don't buy the books you want. You just buy them by the foot and you can buy green books or white books or gray <laughs> books or old books to make you look smart. You know, and they, you, you know just for, so that's how I got, I got that. How, how much was the book that looks like yours? <laughs> Do you see that subtle product placement? Yeah. <laughs> I think they are alive. Oh, I forgot to turn the light on. Look, it illuminates. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm not sure that's much different. Uh, but uh, yeah, I. this is other than our... I, it's amazing I made it through the coronavirus pandemic without you know being a, addicted to Zoom, uh, un, unlike some people. But um, but I'm still trying to figure out like the backgrounds. It looks like I'm in the Bahamas or something like that. Um, yeah, I, if I could figure that out, then, then would be set. We got to work on it. All right. So here's what we're, I think we're going to do this today. Right? We're going to play buzzwords, theological buzzwords. Then we're going to do CNN or Babylon B. We got a great email like a year ago some great stuff and maybe some of that news will be will be uh, relevant enough for us to um to grab onto it and do some 10 commandments in the news and then uh if that's if we run out of time then we're going to do what's in your pastor's library does that sound good sounds good to me it was just my buzzword right. sacrifice boom nice not only am i saying it to you i'm showing you how to spell it now let me read to you from today's edition of the Treasury of Daily Prayer. You know that Treasury of Daily Prayer? Today is apparently St. John Chrysostom Day, hmm. the golden lip. Is that what that means, Chrysostom? Golden lip? Golden mouth, maybe. Mouth, yeah. He was this great. He, he it has a great little text from him. It says, so, so truly, so inexpressibly great are the benefits that God has bestowed upon us he sacrificed himself for his enemies who hated and rejected him. What no one would do for friends, for brothers, for children, that the Lord has done for his servants. A Lord not himself, such as one of his servants, 
but God for men, for men not deserving. Whew, that's great. So this idea of Jesus on the cross is the sacrifice, the final sacrifice to take away sins and bear our iniquities and so forth and so on. So he sacrificed himself for his enemies. Beautiful text. That's great. My theological buzzword for you, which you'll have to be an auditory learner to uh, to get, is a uh, is the word angel. Now I have a I have a pop quiz for you, Pastor Wolf. True right. or false? Uh, Jesus is an angel. Oh, that's a tricky question. <laughs> I'll do it for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. False. I'll bite. Uh-huh. Oh, false. Well, uh, uh, I mean, there's there's different sense of the word angel, right? This is this is the trick. So there's there's uh, an angel. What ontologically, I guess you could say, an angel being a created being. So uh, we know that God has uh, created um, immaterial beings, but yet um, real nonetheless, uh, who are uh, servants of God and 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 serve Him and serve us according to His bidding, and that would be you know a created angel. And so that's one sense of angel. But we could also talk about Jesus being an angel in the sense that angel means messenger. And so in, in the in the way that Jesus is a messenger who brings us the good news, we're in the season of Epiphany where where God is enlightening or manifesting Himself to us through the person of Jesus. Uh, then He is in that sense a messenger. So that way we can talk about Jesus being an angel. Uh, so you see this uh, meaning perhaps in the book of Revelation. We have the letters of the seven churches. And are they calling you angel there at at, uh, at St. Paul yet? Have you worked that in? They haven't. St- well, I, they want to all the time. And I said, <laughs> no, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but each letter to like Philadelphia and um, you know, Sardis and all these places, um, th- th- it goes to the angel at Philadelphia. And uh, we think that possibly that could be referring to the pastor, the messenger at that place. So angel has maybe two different meanings. Oh, that's a nice way to say it. So angel is an, the word angel refers to an office and it can be a human person filling that office, or it can be uh, a, a spirit. What's what we normally mean, the spirits that fulfill that office. And also Jesus is called in the Old Testament, the angel, of the Lord, and so forth. Probably, some people think that's what Luther means when in the morning and evening prayer, let your holy angel be with me. So it refers to the holy angel in singular, could be referring to the guardian angel, but it could be also referring to Christ. So that's that's a dispute there as well. But so yeah, so angels. Often, when we talk specifically about what we normally mean by angels, we the the language that the Bible uses, spirit. Mm-hmm. That referred so spirit refers to their being. Angel refers to their office. Yeah, very good. All right, so we're gonna do some CNN or Babylon B now. For those who maybe don't know, Babylon B is a satire news site. Uh, they make up fake news stories. Or a bit comical. Uh, it's it's maybe a commentary. This just there are some games that we play on Table Talk Radio that are that that just the fact that we play them is making the point more than you know teaching discernment like a lot of our games are. And and I think what this one is is just showing how crazy the world is today that we live in. That we that there may be a debate whether a headline is actually news from an agency like say CNN. Uh, or whether it's satire, it's meant to be comical, it's meant to be funny, like Babylon B. So that, that's the whole trick in this game. I think I might get you on some of these. Okay. You got this, me last time we played this, so this all good. right, let's hear it. Okay, here's the first one. CNN or Babylon B. David Axelrod, I woke up this morning as an alternative fact. <laughs> uh David Axelrod. I don't know who that is. Is that David Axelrod is oh he was um he was an advisor in President Obama's administration. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. So I'm, I'm chief strategist, say... apparently look, I'm looking here. Chief strategist for the 2008 and 2012 Obama campaigns. Okay. But, I mean that sounds pretty official. Um that that might be real news, but I'm gonna say that that's probably from the Babylon Bee. Well, let's just take a screen share here. CNN, David <laughs> Axelrod. I woke up this morning as an alternative fact. <laughs> That's unreal. <laughs> In justifying the appointment of Steve Bannon, the president's chief strategist to the National Security Council, Trump spokesman Sean Spicer cited my role on the Obama White House as a precedent. Spicer said press secretary Robert Gibbs and I attended classified National Security Council meetings all the time. 
that's simply not true. <laughs> B, well. B, C it in zero, Babylon B one, <laughs> Evan zero. Let's talk about that just alternative fact and the idea of fake news. Um, just, I mean, and the Ten Commandments on that, how the Ten Commandments fit in, and what, and any thoughts on that, on that thing. Well, I mean, th this this is probably the problem we're seeing. You know, there's been a lot of talk, especially the last four years, about fake news, um, and and one of the dynamics that we see playing into all of this um, is the idea that uh, you know. The, the cable news network. So it used to be that your ordinary networks um, would have, you know, nightly news. So you would be watching, you know, the news and then Wheel of Fortune would come on. <laughs> but but then um, with cable television came the advent of these cable news networks where it's news 24-7. Now, that means the only thing that it has to draw and pull attention of its audience is news. And you become now competitive for eyeballs. Uh, to do that. Now you have to make then the news appealing as possible in order to keep an audience uh, to your network if you're a 24 hour news network. Um, so it, it, the cable news networks became much more commentary than it is journalistic and uh, trying to uh, hold people's attention based upon their spin on the news rather than a reporting of an uh, unbiased, objective journalist. So let's uh, let's pick up where we left off there after this break. We still do breaks on the on season two, huh? Wow, I guess so. Very cool. What do we do on video during the breaks? We'll check. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> Hadn't thought that far ahead. Are you gonna dance? <laughs> Uh, maybe you shouldn't dance. <laughs> Busting the myth that practice makes perfect. You're listening to Table Talk Radio. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Yeah. Miss those bumps, huh? Yep, Boy, it's I good do. to get back in the swing of things. DJ quads. <laughs> so before the break, we were talking about how um, you know the the whole cable news network Woo! thing uh, has has changed the way that news is even reported. Yeah. And uh, I remember um, when when um, you know I forget which election year it was, but when Mitt Romney was running against Obama. And well, 2012, or, or was he the first or second? I don't remember. Yeah, either. I can't remember. Um, John Kerry was in there. I think John Kerry was against Obama first and then Mitt Romney. So that must have been 2012, I my guess. Uh, McCain? Was it McCain? McCain. That's what I meant. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, they asked Mitt Romney, you know, what's the difference between politics today and, and politics before? And one of the things that he said that I thought was a re really interesting comment is that it used to be that we would all get the facts of the news from the same source. So you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, uh, left or right, you go home and watch the news and learn what the what the facts were, and then you then you would form differing opinions based upon those facts. But now, um, whether you have certain political views, you go to the source that agrees with your views already to get the news, the facts of the news. So now, um, no one's actually even coming across the same facts. And I think um, that's one of the things that we're seeing with uh, with the cable news networks is that you know you're you're, you're kind of pandering to your audience again to keep their eyeballs to sell advertising. And there isn't the same standard of, of journalistic integrity to say, I'm going to approach this without bias, at least as much as I can. Um, that seems to me that that's not even an effort. And I, and I think one of the, this, this CNN headline is sort of uh, addressing that. What do you think? I, I think so too. I, I, when I was just looking for this, um, I just joined the, gk chesterton society you get their magazine the other day and they were and i was reading this article about how chesterton talks about how we we think that the more national things become the more inclusive they become this is chesterton you know 100 years ago mm -hmm. and they, they he was making the comment the opposite happens is the broader you get then the more you start to narrow into little groups of people that agree with you and this has certainly been the phenomenon of cable news and then the internet and so you think that oh it the broader and the freer the flow of information will mean that's a good thing true enough 
And yet the problem is there's so much that you just have to, you go into silos and here's the, here's the group that agrees with me. Here's the, and so we find ourselves sort of in this little vortex. And I've been in conversations with people and we were, for example, when president Trump was president, we were talking about, and, and it's like, there's a two, two totally different stories that are being told about the same events, the same conversations, the same facts. It's an amazing thing and not necessarily helpful. It's good to remember that the Lord puts us in a family and in a local church because mm. you gotta, you gotta be able to argue with people. You gotta be able to talk to people who think differently than you do. And I, I, those I, local sorry. things force those conversations. If you just go online, you can find a million people that agree with you and that's mm -hmm. maybe not so good. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, that's an interesting point, how it applies to theology. You know, here we are doing a, a Lutheran theological podcast for, you know, listeners all over the world. You know, we have people all over the world uh, downloading it. And, 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 you know, we've we've rejoiced to see how it's been received all over the world. You know, I mean, so so you, so you, you throw out a uh, online event and, and, you know, maybe you get, you know, 500, 1,000 people watching uh, what you're doing, uh, 2,000, I mean, um, you know, I, I, to be honest, haven't uh, looked at our stats for a long time, but, you know, I think at some point we were averaging around six, 7,000, um, listeners on a weekly basis. So you think about like, if, if, if I in, in Rogue River, Oregon were to hold a conference, I would not get 7,000 people come to the conference to hear you and me talk. Um, but, but you throw it, you cast it out to the net of the world and you get, and, and that, that's a, that's a great thing when there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, I wonder though, if it comes at the risk though, is if I'm, if I'm not holding that conference in Rogue River, Oregon, maybe I'm not bumping into the people that I would otherwise, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that sort of maybe is satisfactory that like, Hey, look at the thousands of people we're appealing to. And at the, if, if in doing so, we would avoid the local interests and not trying to engage people, my, my neighbor that lives, lives right next to me. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and so we got to try to live in, we got to try to live locally. The other stuff becomes of, of kind of secondary benefit, you know? So if table talk radio goes away, sometimes if it like a cockroach, we're able to finally <laughs> out. or if the internet goes down or whatever, that's, that's okay. It's, that's going to be okay. What now, how do we take advantage of these things is because, because the niche can thrive when you have a big enough kind of pool in which you can pull uh, people who have various different interests in. That's been the kind of the blessing of the internet, but it's also a danger because now we all get niched, you know? So you can mm -hmm. go online and just talk to Lu confessional Lutherans all the time, you know? Yeah, yeah. And that's, um, and you forget that not everybody thinks that way. Um, so that's the, that's the danger. Now I have to ask now, cause I haven't, talked to you much recently you're off social media yeah yeah i no, i didn't want me, you to find that out tell me why I mean, I mean you are like mr social media so i i'm begging to know what was the thing that made you say i need to get off this when twitter canceled trump i said ah. whoa whoa it made me step up I, but i'm not i got a handful of, i mean i probably have 10 sort of uh, blurry impulse reasons for kind of, I'm just so I'm silent on Facebook silent. I didn't cancel that stuff. Cause I, there's some value. I mean, just, you know, the Facebook maxes out your friends at 5,000 apparently. So I've got I have like 5,000 friends, like a thousand <laughs> you people. The I, max? I was what at about the, Kurt Cameron. He, he, well, he went over to a page. So once you oh. get to a page, you can have as many fans as you want. I see. Which is, I didn't, I thought that was obnoxious. <laughs> I, it's obnoxious anyway to have 5,000 friends. Carrie's like, wow, you should invite them for dinner. <laughs> but w when Twitter uh, canceled Trump and then Facebook and then even YouTube, my own YouTube, I thought th th this is really because you wonder where the persecution is going to come from, right? Is it going to come from the state or is it going to come from big tech? And mm -hmm. now we know. <laughs> I mean, now it's I mean, maybe it both, you know, both things can be true at the same time, but. Now we know who really thinks that they have the upper hand is 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 big tech. And so and so the manipulation of the conversation is not helpful. So here's one thing. I mean, this is one of the nice things about a face-to-face -face conversation 
is that you can your conscience is constantly reading the reaction of the people who are listening to you. And so you can say something and then you can see if they're surprised or if they love it, then you can press further or you know you have to support your argument or whatever you can adjust. Yeah. All of that is gone on social media. What the result is that you're half the time in a fight that you didn't even intend to, to be in. So the, the medium manipulates the conversation in that way. A lot of people are like, well, hey, you're off of Facebook. Come over to MeWe. Apparently, there's a bunch of Lutherans over on the MeWe. And I'm, but I think the whole thing corrupts conversation. And but the problem is it makes it easy. But two, two things happen. If it's that easy to communicate. So I noticed this the other day because I think I'm going to start a new series on issues, et cetera. What I wish my family knew about the Lutheran view of closed communion or baptism or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I need topics on that. So it'd be so easy to just go on Facebook and say, hey, new series, what are your ideas? And poof, there's 300 ideas right there. Boom. You can just crowdsource all this stuff. It's great for that. That was easy. The problem is if it's easy, it's cheap, you know, so that the, the availability of people's opinions on the internet is the, it's a, it's a supply and demand. The supply is so high that there's no demand for it. And the ease of communication there, I think is, so I, that's the problem that I want to wrestle with. I, I want to know how to, I, I, you and I are both interested in this too. We want to know how do you communicate the gospel to people who do not know it? We always want to speak the kindness of the Lord Jesus to people who haven't heard, who, who are not Christian, who are not Lutheran or whatever. And the, the idea, social media says, hey, come here and use us and it's an easy way to do it. But I, I want to think about it more. I think there's, I think there's hard ways to communicate difficult ways to communicate, but better ways to communicate. And so pulling off of Facebook now forces me to ask that question. So if I want to say something like this morning, I took a picture of that John Chrysostom quote. And normally I would post it on Facebook and Instagram and there's a to go and edify. I took the picture and I'm like, oh, I don't have those platforms now. So how can I communicate this? Uh, and, and, and it forces that. So the, so the question forces the innovation. My dad always said that an empty stomach is a creative mind. <laughs> yeah. you, and so I wanted to empty, I, in some ways I'm, it's a fasting so I can think better how to communicate it's put. And so I've put a lot more attention on the website, thinking more about podcasts, uh, and table talk and, and the YouTube stuff and, and these sorts of other things. So kind of that hunger, I, I wanted that to force the creativity. That's well, I mean, it took, it took uh, 10 years, but I'm glad you finally came around to seeing things the way I do. No, that's what I, I think I said on the post when I said, away from social media, don't tell Evan. <laughs> At last. I mean, I, I'm such a trendsetter. It just takes a while for it to catch on, you know? True enough. True enough. <laughs> but, you know, I want to go back to what you said about, um, you know, Twitter and all these accounts, you know, deleting accounts. And we're not just talking about, uh, someone, you know, who's who's like a conspiracy theorist who's who's drawing up all the stuff. Well, they they have the right to say the, those things too. I'm not saying they wouldn't, but we're talking about the president of the United States of America. Um, now, do you do you know what kind of power we're giving to these companies who can silence, who can who can stop the president of the United States from speaking to the people? Mm -hmm. uh, so that, I mean, that is an amazing amount of power that we've granted these companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should concern us that I, I like the way you put it, that the conversation is being manipulated. Um, I, if someone has a differing perspective than I do, I want them to be able to say it, number one, and two, say the reasons that they believe the thing so that I can, I can know whether what I think is wrong or if I need to re rethink it. So, right. We right. should get back to this game after the break. It's a break already? Man, I'm oh, man. Talk radio listeners, does it take to change a light bulb? You'll probably have to settle for one. <laughs> that joke never gets old. Boom! Going? Recording again. You were talking at the break how uh, you're reviving the art of writing letters. Uh, like typing out a letter. Yeah. You, you took a pen and you actually did, did. You have a hard time finding envelopes. <laughs> no. Are those still a thing? I got a thing. Um, Look, I'm gonna see. I'm here. My. 
Jeez. <laughs> At least now I know when you're off mic. Before it was just like, where'd he go? Yeah, I know. I, I don't. I, this is try. I can't play. You know, a Slitherio and all these games on my phone while we record. <laughs> I got this up here. Stationary. Thank you. Stamps. This is my box. Nice. This nice. Bo- someone sent like a turkey. Sent, sent like a turkey soup when I got sick, and it came in this box. I was like, nice. that's kind of a cool box. So I think I'll, I think I'll use that for my writing endeavors. Yes, that's right. <laughs> anyway, Danny was really for laughing about will? about being a trendsetter as the Amish. They're like, you know, you guys, <laughs> we tried telling you. <laughs> you. One day you'll be writing letters again. You just wait. <laughs> you know, I, there's something about I probably now I'm thinking about this more that I probably it's it's just sort of driving me back to I might write a book. You know, thinking about well, I don't know if it'll be helpful or not, but. Anyway, yeah, we okay. we've been using we've been to, for the reading of scripture. We've been using scrolls. It's it's really nice. We we get away from the technology of bound books and we just use a scroll to to read the text. So you might try that. Yeah, so, uh, papyrus. Yeah, we had it done. <laughs> I uh, it is a um it is a curious thing, is it not to say how now do we? I don't know how how do we communicate in these days where the public square is privately owned. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, truth, truth be told, uh, you not utilizing Facebook doesn't make a difference. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> in, in the sense that, OK, um, big tech canceled uh, Trump and is silencing one side of the conversation. Uh, you know, a bunch of people even closing their accounts probably doesn't make a difference. The, the question is, is, is it going to? hit their bottom line. And and we have seen, I think Twitter was down something like 14% in their stock uh, since canceling um, uh, the president. Uh, I don't know what Facebook is, but I mean, that's where it's really going to matter when they start seeing their stock plummet yeah. uh, from these things. And that's what we have to really see. So um, wh- whether uh, Brian Wolfmuller is on Facebook or not is, does not, well, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is like, no, yeah, it's, it's a, it is a crazy <laughs> thing. Isn't it right? Is that like the worst thing? They're like, you canceled Trump. Well, I'm going to cancel myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, I mean, but, I, but I don't. But I want. It's because I want. You know, the reason is I want to. I, I want to just think about the problem. That's that, that's what it, it forces me to think about the problem. It's an inconvenience. It's like a string around your finger. You know, you it. It forces. Yeah. It forces. But you, it's really funny how the things that Facebook has done to try to get me back. So I never got. I started to get emails from Facebook about, oh, this person updated their stat or whatever, and I'm like, what? And I so I blocked the email, and then I started getting text. They started oh, really? texting me. Interesting. Like. Dear Brian, <laughs> you know there's a there's a documentary about that um, on on Netflix. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. What's it called? Uh, uh, the social dilemma. I saw yeah. that, and so now it's I'm like I'm watching it in real time, and I'm getting all these like updates yeah. from Twitter and LinkedIn and what right. the. Anyway, I, mean, I mean, to be sure, if there was a mass ex- exodus, there would certainly it would certainly make a difference. But I'm just, I'm just saying that you know. So we joked about the Amish, and the, and the whole thing the Amish did is they 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 said we're not we're not engaging in technology, and you have to wonder, you know, are they even then players in the conversation? Then you know, are are we? So that that's the that's the dilemma that we have is that we. Um, we want to be conscious of the ways that we're engaging the world. At, at, to our own demise, perhaps. At the same time, if we just remove ourselves completely, are we are we even contributing to um, the conversation? Yeah. How about this as, as an interesting experiment? So I wrote away from social media. I wrote a blog post about it, and I I, I post stuff. I mean, everything sort of filters into the blog, but I haven't been paying. I don't think I'd had a comment on a blog post in two years, and I wrote that one. And I probably had 50 people comment on the post. Hmm. And I just wonder if everyone's like, oh, well, we can't we can't respond there. We'll go over here. And that's actually nice because I have a little bit of control over that, uh, you know. Uh, anyway, Interesting. And, the, and I'm focusing on the Wednesday whatnot. I want to focus, though, on this game. I'm ready for another headline. Okay, CNN or Babylon B. Ready? <laughs> yep. Now, you think I did CNN, so I should switch to Babylon B. So that would be the logical choice for me to do, to try, you know, you can't do rock two times in a row, but now, because I know that, 
but this is double reverse psychology. I know how this works. But I might do triple reverse. So you might think I might stick with CNN. So if I, okay. So here it is. Here's the headline. Marge Simpson responds to Trump advisors Kamala Harris comparison. You know, if that's CNN, I quit. So I'm going to go with uh, Babylon B. Let's just check it out. The screen share here. Marge, CNN. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, <laughs> oh. Politics have really gotten serious when a beloved but fictional animated character feels compelled to defend herself against a real world slight. Jenna Ellis, Trump campaign advisor and lawyer, recently trolled presumptive Democrat vice president nominee Kamala Harris by saying her voice sounded like the character of Marge Simpson on the long running animated series, The Simpsons. On Friday, the show's verified Twitter account tweeted a video of Marge's response. No, brother. I don't usually get into politics, says Marge Simpson, but the president's senior advisor, Jenna Ellis, just said Kamala Harris sounds like me, the character said, explaining that Lisa, one of the children in the show, told her. Lisa said she doesn't mean it as a compliment. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I maybe the phrase, maybe the phrase came out first somewhere else. But the first time I heard the phrase was from uh, Hans Feeney when he was writing for a uh, Federalist article, and he talked about uh, outrage addiction. Yeah, and that that there's a, there's actually a, a chemical reaction going on in your brain when you're outraged, and it becomes an addiction like anything else. So. Like uh, we, 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 we look at our phones, we look at the latest, latest news feed just to see what we're outraged about now because we need that fix. Right. And, uh, you know, someone being upset because they said a, 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 a political figure's voice sounds like a cartoon character being something that could make it to a legitimate, well, I should say I mean legitimate, but a news agency, <laughs> an article written about this. I guess I guess that's my hit for the day. I, I'm good. It is. I mean, you, we look at our phones and we say, "What do you want from me? You, anger, fear? You know that those that's and they, and the internet says, yeah, that's what I want. What about hilarity? That's our role. Yeah, that's right. we're providing that 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 addiction. Here's another one. Okay, <laughs> this is, I'm bound to get one. I'm o for two. Men's Health magazine celebrates body positivity with first obese cover model <laughs> oh man i see i think this is the one where i'm playing off of your psychology a little bit because i i doubt you'd go three in a, a row cnn i really don't think you would i'm but see i think this this could legitimately be a cnn piece because this is this is part of the the cultural conversation and that's what makes babylon be so funny is because it picks up on some of the conversations going on and sort of exploits them to um for their humor so um but i i think this is uh babylon b you are right <laughs> at least i got one right chip adoyle words world's first body positive trainer <laughs> 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 10 ways to feel better about yourself without exercising dismantling <laughs> traditional views of health and fitness in a move being hailed as progressive win for men everywhere, Men's Health Magazine encouraged body positivity by introducing the world's first fat positive fitness model, Chip O'Doyle, in its next issue. You just hate to be the guy that they pick for that picture, you know? It's like when they do the news story about child obesity and they show the B-roll and you're like, hey, I'm on the news. <laughs> um, but you, know, you got one. You know, there's... You know, the, but the reason this is part of the conversation, though, I, I think the phrase that's out there now is like fat shaming, you know, mm -hmm. you heard of that mm -hmm. um, there, there's I think there's two sides to this. Um, on the one hand, we shouldn't we shouldn't go out and be mean to people. Right. We shouldn't we shouldn't uh, intend to just offend people. At the same time, we are so easily offended. <laughs> you know, I mean. Um, we, it, it's fascinating to go back and read like some of Luther's writings, for example, as he's debating, um, Erasmus or somebody like this. And just to see the, uh, this isn't a commentary on Luther. It's a commentary on, um, how the way people could debate in years past, um, was able to, to take the blows of what we would just be 
completely offended by. Mm -hmm. And as soon as, as soon as we're offended, then there, there goes that, again, that outrage. And so now it's no longer even about an issue. It's about whether so-and-so was, was offended or whether someone sound was offensive. Um, and these, these kinds of things. Um, and so it completely misses. I mean, we're, we're so we're, we're busy walking on eggshells to not offend anyone that we can't even say anything anymore. Um, so that there's actually a place with, without, I'll, are you trying to fat shame Luther by bringing him he up? He could have been on time? the cover. I'm offended that you would even suggest that image during my talk about fat shaming. <laughs> you see how it goes? But, but I mean, there should be a way to talk about, you know, a, a healthy weight and stuff without someone being fat shamed, this kind of a thing. So I, I don't know. know. That, that's my thought on that one. I know. That's right. There's, it, 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 it's, there's problems on this on every direction. You know, you have the, we have this culture that, I mean, our, our picture of beauty is probably ridiculous. You know, uh, the, the, the thinness and the kind of body fat percentage that we think is acceptable for someone to be beautiful is, an absurdity and an, an, an oppressive absurdity, especially for women. That's a bump. It is. Hold that more about this on the other side. Or are we done? We got one more. Okay. okay. Tell me why, but you've been listening to Table Talk Radio. Let's do it. I'm recording. Boop, 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 boop. Not Joel bringing us in. <laughs> Look, my battery ran out of my book light. Oh, I can't even see it anymore. <laughs> what were you saying before you got cut off? The, the bump music so rudely interrupted you. The We got the problem of the body image in our culture. Uh, this taps in. This is a symptom of our cultural anthropology, which is consumed and consuming. We are internally consumed by defined by our victimhood. And we are externally consumers defined by our whatever materialism that's our basic kind of anthropological stance of our culture and so the way that we think of our own bodies factors into it you got to be real skinny to be beautiful or that that's oppressive on the one side or you, nobody can say anything about it so it's okay to be sort of dangerously whatever hedonistic you just you don't have yeah. to care about being healthy on the other side so there's no real sort of just sense of our body is a is a tool given by God to receive as gifts. That, that's just kind of lost. Hmm. Ah, anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah like you said, there, there's there's balance on these things. On the one hand, I, I mean, I, th I think there are people who uh, take health of their body to such an extreme extent that it's almost. I mean, I guess for some people, it's a, it's a heart issue, but but it, it becomes a uh, almost an idolatry of the body, you know. Um, but at the same time, like you said, we are placed here that, that our bodies are not our own. You know, they've been bought with a price that we would glorify God in our bodies. So, so that we would use our bodies in service to our neighbor and to the glory of God. And so just to just completely abuse our bodies, just to, you know, introduce to our bodies harmful things and to be unhealthy. You know, that's not uh, a Christian's endeavor either. Um, that's why I work out so much. <laughs> I work out to the glory of God. <laughs> hey, I just lost power. Wow. That... <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry. The power went out. That's good. That's why, you know, the, the Lord, Lord was, the he Lord heard... is like, I'm, I'm calling you on that one. That's <laughs> Oh yeah. You work out. <laughs> you don't even have the strength to turn on the power switch. So here's the thing. I'm on battery backup right now. I don't know how much time I have. I think I have about uh, 20 minutes of battery backup, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Just so you know. Is it your snowstorm? No, wow. it's not snowing. It, it was snowing last night, but it, it's not now. So uh, I don't maybe know. Maybe the lights will come back. Well, we'll do what we can. Okay, so I got some more headlines for you. Are you ready? <laughs> this is great. NASA, <laughs> NASA publishes official guide to more inclusive space terms. <laughs> Oh man! This Recognizing the the intrinsic racism of things like the Cesar Chavez galaxy, NASA has published this official guide to more inclusive space terms. That's your headline there. This, see, this could go either way. I mean, obviously, this is a big thing right now. The whole you know gender again being offensive, being offended all the time, and 
And, uh, but this seems a little out there, no pun intended. I think that um, I would be surprised that NASA's taken up this kind of work. So I'm going to say this is Babylon B. Let's just check. You are right, Babylon. <laughs> look, at these, look at these names. It's great. Red Giant is now Indigenous Star of Size. <laughs> White Dwarf is Racist Little Person. <laughs> this is so great. Uh, binary star, first of all, how dare you? This is great. Black hole, incredibly dense region of color. <laughs> Milky Way is the soy Milky Way. Spaceship, vehicle of evil human colonizers of <laughs> <laughs> xenomorphs. That must be the alien from the alien movies, is called Peaceful Protester. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That is great. Uh, man. But, you know, we, we're seeing this, right? I mean, so the Washington Redskins are changing their, their logo name. Did you hear about that? Um, you know, I think the more interesting thing on that is because that's been going on for a long time. You know, like high schools have been having to change their mascots and things like that. In Oregon, um, they had a big push for that. Um, I, I think that schools have to have some kind of a sponsorship by a local tribe in order to have – uh, Indian or anything related to that in their names in our in our state, um, but but you know the 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 magnitude of the Washington Redskins was just kind of resistant to that. But I think that the interesting um, story about that is not so much um, whether we should be using or whether it honors um, the uh, tribes in in doing these things, but. That, that the Washington Redskins were able to, were, were basically put under the pressure, the political pressure. So here, here's um, – maybe this is going to throw at you, Pastor Wilson, real quick. The, the, the term right now is cancel culture. If someone doesn't agree with, with my perspective or even my agenda, then we boycott, we, we take away their sponsorship, we try to punish them financially in some way or another um, so that they will succumb to my perspective. What, what's your – What's your thought on all this cancel culture talk? It is, it's the currency of shame. So all of us want to fit in. It's just part of our intrinsic humanity. Um, by the way, you look better than ever. I don't know. <laughs> so we all, we, so speaking of shame, uh, we, we all, uh, so we all want to fit in. And our conscience, by the way, is sensitive to the expectation. We were talking about this earlier, sensitive to all these expectations around us. And so... And so we, there's this, it's one of the things that we as a Christian church have to think about, because one of the dangers is when we exclude people like from close, from communion, because of closed communion, that we shame them. We don't want to shame them, you know, but it just sometimes happens that way. And so we're trying to avoid it, but that's, that's the currency of the cancel culture. You're, you are not acceptable to us. And so you're out. So it's, it's in some ways, it's like a cultural bullying is, is what it is. And it hurts. It shouldn't hurt because our glory. So, so, so think about this. I was at doxology a couple of weeks ago and Dr. Kleinig was talking about guilt and shame and comparing the two and contrasting the two. And he says, it helps to think about the opposites. So the opposite of guilt is innocence. The opposite of shame is honor. Mm -hmm. And so, so we become guilty when we break the law. We become shamed when we break the expectations of those around us. Now, here's an interesting thing. When the law of God and man's law and the culture are sort of in relation to each other, then guilt and shame come at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. like if you're not married and you get pregnant 50 years ago, you were guilty and you were you felt shamed because the, the 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 cultural expectations and the law of God matched up. But what happens now is we're in the time where those two things are separating. So the law of God over here and the and the expectations of culture over here. And the result is that we become we can be shamed by by even though we are not guilty. And it's a difficult thing to kind of grasp. I think this is what David is wrestling with in Psalm 4. When he says, how long, O men, will you turn my glory into shame? So that one of the ways the devil gets after us is he wants to take the things that we should glorify, we should be glorified in and turn it into something shameful and vice versa, something that we should be ashamed of and say, no, no, boast in it, you know, have a march or whatever to support it or, you know, that kind of thing. And so it's this reversal of glory and shame. And so cancel culture 
um, uh, uh, traffics in that. The result is going to be that we're not going to have as many closed communion problems <laughs> because it's going to be, again, immoral, according to the culture, for to come to church where where people confess Christ as Lord and the Ten Commandments is true. So, right. Yeah. There's just the mere association. Like, why, why even darken the doors, those hateful people, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So cancel culture comes back on, you know, comes back on us now. So, yeah. Great. Well, I think we have time for one more. You got another one there? Yep. Uh, let's see here. We have two minutes here. Um, telling young people to stay inside during pandemic is like telling them to abstain from sex. Here <laughs> are some better ideas. Oh, yeah. Um, that's got to be CNN. It sure is. Okay, so the, oh boy, this this argument. So this is the old argument that says, uh, look, if you tell you tell young people to um, abstain from sex, and they're just going to go have sex, so you know, give them safe ways to do it. And so what? What actually? I mean, so we've been seeing that argument, um, and we've been seeing the promotion then of of uh, of safe sex rather over against uh, abstinence, and what we're seeing is not a decrease of STDs or a decrease of, uh, of teen pregnancy, things like this. We're actually seeing an increase of those things. And why? Well, because um, they become more promiscuous. They're taught like this could be done safely and it's, it's okay. It's morally neutral. So let's just, you know, have fun, just do it in a safe way, but it actually increases the activity. So therefore becomes um, uh, a, a problem. And, and so, I mean, I, I've always said, could, could we apply that to any any other moral category in the world? Saying, you know, robbing, you know, telling someone to not rob banks is never going to work. So let's just teach them to rob banks in a safe way. You know, give them unloaded guns and then it'll be fine. You know, I mean, there's no other moral category that you'd say, you know, telling them to do this is not going to work. So let's just tell them to do it in a in a in a safe way. I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. So uh, it does not surprise me that CNN would, would, would say, look, you know, you, you can't tell young people what to do. So just give them different things to do that would conform to the behavior that we want. They're may trying to make this argument with abortion, if you can believe it. Yeah. If real you quick, about it, 10, 10 seconds here, pastor. So you make it illegal and you make it legal and it, and it becomes less frequent. It's a, but it's a malicious argument, very malicious argument. Uh, hey, well, thanks for uh, joining us for season two of Table Talk Radio. Where the points are like the knife that Abraham brought to the hill with Isaac. <laughs> That's a when good one. Angel stopped the sacrifice. <laughs> thanks for listening oh, to this edition nice. of Table Talk Radio. <laughs> Table Talk Radio. Glory. Is Please consult your pastor before listening to Table Talk Radio. Can you believe it? Heartburn, hair loss, hallucinations. Oh, man. I thought you'd been thinking Psychosis about that one for a while. Psychosis, I just, it just came to bang. Wow. Internal combustion. A sudden now I know no, no one's feeding it to you on Facebook. Hey, guys, someone give me a flinch joke. Angel sacrifice. Quick. Quick. All right. Oh, all right. You better go buy a generator. Yeah, I need to go. 